And uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Derek Alconis from Los Angeles County Fire Department, also a member of the Fire Ground Survival Group here with the IFF. We also have Steve Kerber of UL and Dan Majikowski of NIST. And uh, we're going to spare you with all the details of our bios. If you want to learn more about especially these two guys, there's not much learned about me, but you can Google them. I'm sure a bunch of stuff will come up, so you can check that out. I wanted to start this off by sharing a story. I go in this huge room, and there it seems to be thousands of people there. And they start to talk about different subjects that are, I don't know, uh, that, that, you know, that they're uh, prominent topics in the fire service. Current events, what's going on? And so I'm listening. And then they start to turn to the subject of structural fire behavior and some of the research that's being done by UL and NIST and some of the stuff that had recently come out about ventilation and about how we need to be conscious of how we ventilate a structure. And perhaps we haven't been trained correctly or we haven't been performing to the way that the research says we should perform. The two prominent members of the fire service, of which you probably know, and I'm not going to mention their names, but they basically wanted to throw the research, roll it up in their hands, and throw it in the trash can. Uh, what they said appalled me as a career firefighter. They basically said, you know what, what these guys have dedicated their lives to do to improve the fire service and what we do as firefighters, forget about it. Just do like we were taught to do. And as our grandfathers and our fathers had experienced or the veteran firefighters have told you to do. Don't be concerned about the research. Well, that's sticking your head in the sand. If we're professional firefighters, then we have a responsibility to do the research, to make sure what we're doing is correct. It makes sense. In fact, Retired General McCaffrey mentioned that in his talk. He said, true leaders know something. They're smart. He even said they read. We have to read. These reports are long. We understand that. Some of them are 500 pages long. It's going to be difficult for you to go through 500 pages. But they've got executive summaries that are about 10 pages. All you need to know is right there. So we're going to take you through several things here. Um, I share that story because this slide right here, knowledge versus belief. Well, let's look at some of these things. They're posed as questions. Because some folks believe that if you vent, it actually cools. Dan mentioned this in his talk this morning. Is that really true? And you have to look at these. They're, they're, they're stated as questions because it should provoke some kind of thought in your mind, is it, does it really mean it's cooling? If I ventilate a structure, I'm going to promote more cooling? No. Exterior fire attack is for defensive strategy only. That's not necessarily true, is it? Basement fire should be attacked from the top down. Exterior fire attack will push fire. I like that phrase, pushing fire. Because in wildland firefighting, where I come from in LA County, when I pull out, when I when I was an engine company captain, shoot, probably, you know, during the course of the wildland season, you may go on 20 or so grass and wildland fires. And during that time, when we pulled our inch and a half out and we were charging up the hill and the grass was on fire and the wind was blowing at our back at around 15 to 20 miles an hour, you know what? In order to put the fire out, we put water on it. And it didn't push the fire up the hill to make it bigger. And we even brought helicopters in and dumped more water on the fire and that put it out too. So it's kind of interesting. It does. Water puts out fire. It doesn't push it. Okay, exterior fire attack will hurt victims. This is another personal experience that I've had in working in some of the busier areas of LA County. One particular area which I worked at for about nine years, um, the residents were very aggressive if they had a fire inside their home. And in fact, we would often see them with their garden hose going like this 
and putting the fire out as we arrive. And just a garden hose would do amazing things inside of a window. So was it hurting the victims inside? No, as we rushed in the front door, typically people were okay. They were getting out. It wasn't hurting us either. It wasn't pushing the fire in our direction. The best way to aid victims is vent the building and search before suppression. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail because we've got a lot to share, but think about those things. What do you know about those, these statements? And uh, let's put some facts to it. Okay, so if you hear these statements, never ventilate, never go inside, always throw water from the outside, no. Never go over a basement fire, never vertically vent, or everything you did in the past was absolutely incorrect. And if someone's telling you that the, this is what the research is telling us, then you're either not reading it carefully or you're not listening carefully because this is absolutely false. The research doesn't say any of these things. And so the discussions that we have in our firehouses um, that get very emotional over this topic, and we all know that, that we know that, we've been there, we've experienced it firsthand. These are the kind of statements that, that are offered by folks. They're saying never go inside. They're crazy. They're saying we can't vertically ventilate. They're saying that, you know what, everything that the folks that came before us did was wrong. That's not, that's not the truth. The, the way firefighters were fought 30 years ago were due to what was burning 30 years ago. Times have changed. They're going to present those facts. All right, here's what we should be hearing or should be thinking. That we know from our experience in the fire ground that it's rare that there's an always or a never you know, that's, uh, the, 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 the fire ground is dynamic. It's always changing. <clears throat> or the next statement, that's why we do that. It's glad to know that I've been doing something right. That's why we do it. That could work for my department if we train on it. Say that statement over to yourself and you say, shoot, yeah, I think if I applied that, that would work in our department. I can use this information to be more educated, aggressive than ever to do these things, to put the fire out faster and more efficiently, to have less of a chance of getting hurt or killed, to preserve more property, and of course to reduce the chance of victims or ourselves being killed or injured. And you know, like that statement says right there, the science of firefighting is not that complicated. It's about the fire triangle, and they're going to demonstrate that for us. But as firefighters or structural firefighters, we have not been trained in the uh, subject of fire behavior very well. And this is just a snapshot of what's going on in the country, around the country. Now, some of you work in different states that may have or may require more fire behavior training. But here's just a snapshot. Firefighter one, you've got 102 hours of total fire training. Some are more, some are less. We understand that. But only three, only three hours of fire behavior training goes on within that 102 hours. How about firefighter two? You got 60 hours. There's no fire behavior training. And then as you progress up the ranks, there is no fire behavior training for structural firefighting. Now, for those of you who are wildland fire, firefighters, that may be different. Because you do have S-190, which takes you eight hours. S-290, that's 16 hours. S-390, that's four days, uh, five days. And S-490, that's another five days. So that's quite a bit of, you know, of, uh, of education as you make your way through the ranks in wildland firefighting. So we're going to have to invest. In fact, this is going to be addressed on the next Health and Safety IFF firefighting grant, uh, AFG grant. They're going to dedicate some resources to developing a structural fire behavior course curriculum of some sort. And we just found this out earlier in the week. So that's exciting. Let's look at our experience. So if we don't get the if we're not getting the information from our, edu our, our education, then obviously we're getting it from our experience. 
But if you look at this slide, and obviously it, it, it doesn't represent everybody in this room, however, you just take a snapshot of how many fires that we go on as in the United States, about 500,000 per year, okay? <clears throat> so in here, you go, you know, 10 million structure fires in 20 years, about 500,000 per year. A typical career, typical career, you may go on 10 good structure fires. Um, now, some of you have been on maybe that in half the time. We understand that. But the point is, is you can't get a big mustache like that unless you've been on some structure fires, right? <laughs> That's what that is. That's a mustache. That's not baling from a whale. <laughs> and you can't get your helmet like that unless you've really been in a lot of fires. But we're not getting a whole lot of fires out there. So we have to shore up that lack of experience with something else, which is education. And the scientists are providing the research to, um, to ensure that we're doing things correctly. So what has changed over, over the you know, last several years in firefighting? Well, the expectations of the fire service definitely has changed. We go on a variety of different calls, and uh, you know, it's an all-hazard fire department now. Technology, the fire environment, fire service research, the pace of change is incredible. And we have to stay relevant. With all this new information coming out, we have to be able to read it, understand it, and implement it with, when, within our, each of our organizations, which is probably the most challenging, is these folks are getting the stuff out there, and it's well published, and it's easily accessed. The challenge is, is how do we implement it? And within today's presentation, you're going to see just one way on how you can implement it. All hazard, these are all the different expectations on a fire department. We know they're plentiful, but nonetheless, you know, we're responsible for ensuring that our firefighters are well trained to be able to respond to these emergencies. These are just, you know, just a snapshot of all the different things that are changing. You look at the turnout gear from past to present, the SCBAs. And, uh, you know, the thermal imager, the nozzles, the um, blowers, the apparatus, times are changing. Well, it would just make sense that we would have a better grasp on what is happening fire behaviorally inside of a structure fire. And luckily, we have, we're, we're living in a day and age where we have access to that information. We can repeat experiments over and over again in a laboratory to ensure we get the data that will um, inform us on how best to go about structured firefighting. So with that, we're going to go to Steve, and uh, he's going to tell us a bit, little bit about the research that UL is doing.